The next statement we're going to hear is going to be made by Ms. Studd, Queen's Counsel, on behalf of the Mayor of London. Yes, Ms. Studd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The evidence called in relation to Module 5 and Module 6, Part 1, has examined the operational response of the <coughs> LFB on the night of the fire and has included an examination of where that response might have been lacking in coordination and effectiveness. In particular, it has examined what was known internally in relation to the risk of cladding fires in high-rise buildings and the extent to which those known risks were communicated within the organisation or by way of training. It is essential that the tragedy of the Grenville Tower fire provides a focus for change, both within the LFB and indeed with other fire and rescue services, and the central governmental approach to the reform of fire and building regulation. Nothing in these closing remarks should distract from the powerful closings of the BSRs this morning. The Mayor supports the call for a Hillsborough law and clearly recognises the need for a statutory duty of candour in the public interest. In his opening to Module 5, the Mayor set out the changes in governance of the LFB made pursuant to the Greater London Authority Act 1999 as amended by the Policing and Crime Act 2017. The inquiry will be aware from the evidence called in relation to this module and the Mayor's opening that prior to the 1st of April 2018, the LFB was overseen by the London Fire and Emergency Planning Authority, referred to as LFIPA. Since the 1st of April 2018, the Mayor appoints the Deputy Mayor for Fire and Resilience and the London Fire Commissioner, sets the London Fire Commissioner budget and agrees its Community Risk Management Plan, which is the primary organisational strategy. The LFC has operational independence, but the Mayor retains the power to issue directions on the exercise of his or her functions. And directions were issued on the 1st of April 2018 to set out the governance process for major decisions. In short, and to avoid lengthy repetition, the Mayor and Deputy Mayor for Fire and Resilience have used the powers available to them under the new governance regime to ensure that the London Fire Commissioner provides greater assurance on how he is implementing necessary improvements and to undertake more intrusive monitoring. This is done through various means within both the GLA and the LFB, including regular process reports, scrutiny at monthly board meetings and deep dive sessions, the establishment of an LFC audit committee and the appointment of an operational assurance advisor, a role created after your inquiry's phase one report and the inspectorate inspection report to give an independent assurance on LFB's operational practice. From previous submissions provided by the mayor and others, the inquiry will be aware of the steps taken by the current commissioner to reform and transform the LFB by amendment and development of its policies, procedures, culture and training. The LFC has published the Transformation Delivery Plan, which is supported by the Mayor and addresses the findings of your inquiry's Phase 1 report and the Inspectorate report, as well as setting out priorities for wider reform. Part of the evidence called in the course of Module 5 and Module 6 Part 1 has demonstrated a number of areas where the LFB fell short of the standard of preparedness to be expected. Such matters should not be laid at the door of individual firefighters on the fire ground, but more upon the institution and the organisational structure. The Mayor particularly noted the evidence in relation to the following issues. One, the quality, rollout and monitoring of training for operational staff, both on the fire ground and in the control room, and the unsatisfactory process for improving training in response to known risks, particularly, but not exclusively, 
in the light of the coroner's Lacanal House fire recommendations. Secondly, the lack of adoption of the national operational guidance prior to the Grenville Tower fire. Thirdly, the failure to adequately address the concerns raised regarding the utility of the communication system being used at Grenville and the evidence that they had been shown to be unsatisfactory on previous occasions. Fourthly, the inadequate gathering of risk information during familiarisation visits and indeed the inadequacy of the risk familiarisation visits generally. Fifthly, the lack of preparedness by the LFB for the likelihood of a cladding fire in a high-rise building when experience had shown that such fires could and should have been realistically anticipated. Sixthly, the lack of review of known risks of high-rise buildings by central government post lacanal and up till now, and in particular the failure to implement the review of building regulations or take serious action to retrofit high-rise premises with sprinklers. And seventhly, the deeply concerning evidence of misogyny and racism within the LFB, which has no place in public service, nor in our communities, and must be rooted out. The inquiry and the BSRs will want to know what has been done to remedy the situation, not only in the short term, but in addition, what steps have been put in place to ensure that the LFB cannot and will not drift back into complacency. As a result of the findings of the inquiry's phase one report, the LFC, together with the Deputy Commissioner Richard Mills, a new Director of People and a Director of Transformation, and with the support of the Mayor, have made significant progress. Some of the issues detailed in this closing, cl closing, although initially intended to address the recommendations in your Phase 1 report, also touch on the issues of concern raised in evidence in relation to Module 5 and Module 6, Part 1. The key improvements delivered to date can be well illustrated. First of all, training. The inquiry has heard that post Grenville, the LFB commissioned an independent review of training, which has been acted upon. The following changes have been made to date. The LFB have made significant efforts to improve the effectiveness of LFB control. The Assistant Commissioner for Control, a new role, is implementing a controlling improvement plan which includes a competency framework and enhanced training for staff. A policy has been developed and adopted to enable and improve the simultaneous handling of a large number of fire survival guidance calls with relevant training of control room staff to enable them to manage the transition in advice between stay put to get out during an emergency incident when necessary. The operational policy to enable control room officers to distinguish between callers seeking advice and callers requiring rescue has been revised and implemented by way of training. In respect of control room staff, there is now regular and specific refresher training. The lack of a trained evacuation procedure prior to the Grenville Tower fire, which was also absent in national guidance, has been identified in the course of the inquiry as a blind spot and has now been remedied by the LFB, but national guidance remains outstanding. Training in the risks of external wall fires in high-rise buildings is now provided to all operational staff, together with training in the evacuation of such buildings, backed up by appropriate policies. The effectiveness of the new approach was demonstrated at the New Providence wall fire in May of 2021. The LFB have also introduced the use of smoke hoods to facilitate rescue from smoke-filled environments. And the issue of compliance with national operation guidance on incident command was raised by the inspectorate in their first inspection of the LFB. The LFB is now prioritising the implementation of the national operational guidance and has an incident command strategy to ensure that all commanders are trained and or revalidated re as soon as possible. So far as familiarisation visits are concerned, 
the LFB policy on gathering and managing operational risk information, including the procedures for the completion of premises risk assessments, has been updated, and firefighters have been trained in relation to the implementation of the new policy. What is most important is how this is working in practice, and this has been reviewed by the LFB Operational Assurance Advisor, and the LFB have initiated a long-term project called One Risk, with the aim of significantly enhancing how risk information is recorded and used. The issue of communications has several strands. The policy covering communication between the incident commander and the control room operators has been reviewed and a dedicated communication link is now provided between the incident commander and the senior control room officer to enable better management of the fire ground. A system of direct communication sharing critical information between the control room and the incident commander has been developed and the communication between the incident commander and the bridgehead has been improved. The servers on the command units have been upgraded to enhance connectivity and usability of the command support system software. And LFB is in the process of procuring new radios and breathing apparatus, <coughs> and the GLA has asked for assurance work to be undertaken to ensure that those new systems fully address the failings identified in Grenville. The LFB have adopted a diversion and inclusion strategy. This has already resulted in a more diverse workforce than was present in 2017, but there is considerable further work to be done. In collaboration with the Mayor, the LFB has announced an independent review of its culture, led by Nazir Asfal, OBE, to deal with these issues swiftly and efficiently and to provide recommendations to the LFB on such matters. However, these changes and improvements are only as good as the systems in place to ensure sustained change and a culture of continual improvement. Complacency cannot be permitted to return. The inquiry will want to know why and how the new governance system will make a difference when LFB was previously monitored by LFIPA and did not deliver the quality of service that Londoners were entitled to expect. The Mayor and the LFB have been strengthening the, the assurance processes following the Grenville fire Tower fire, particularly after your Phase 1 report, to ensure that risks are being managed, recommendations are being implemented, and improvement measures achieve the intended outcomes. The Mayor acknowledges the impact of the inquiry's Phase 1 report in revealing some of the failures that the LFB has been addressing since publication. Within the LFB, a new business assurance framework has been introduced. The Commissioner has appointed an audit committee and an independent operational assurance advisor tasked with providing assurance on the LFB operational policy and practice, including assessing whether the implementation of the key recommendations from Phase 1 have been effective. On behalf of the GLA, the Deputy Mayor for Fire and Resilience has established a Fire and Resilience Board to scrutinise performance, to challenge the LFB on its improvement work, as well as providing for questioning major decisions which have already been through the LFB governance process before they're approved by the Deputy Mayor. The Commissioner and all senior staff from the LFB attend the Board. The Board meets monthly with an additional deep dive session to, held to scrutinise specific issues in more depth as and when required including on implementation of your recommendations. The GLA fire team supports and enhances the Deputy Mayor and the GLA oversight of the LFB. In relation to the recommendations of the Phase 1 report, there's been a sustained focus on delivery, with the Mayor publishing a monthly report updating Londoners on the progress of your recommendations made in Phase 1. However, Hovering over all these steps being taken in order to improve performance and monitoring of the LFB is the issue of resources. As the Mayor has highlighted in earlier modules, there are significant fire risks in London's built environment, which have been further placed in the spotlight by the tragic fire at Grenville Tower. The past and continuing failure by central government 
to grapple with and reform building regulation, both in relation to its substance and its compliance, has resulted in buildings being built and modified using unsafe materials and substandard installation. Many buildings are deemed to be so lacking in safety standards that they're now subject to specific and expensive safety measures, such as waking watch. There is no evidence to date that there's been any coherent analysis undertaken by government as to how much it will cost to protect the public from unsafe buildings and how much is required to fund the fire and rescue services to enable them to protect the public appropriately from these known risks in the future. As an indication of the scale of the challenge, the government has required LFB to audit over 8,500 high-rise buildings in London as part of the Building Risk Review Programme. Of all high-rise buildings in the, pro in the programme across the UK, 58% are in London. Further, it is clear that the scope of this programme does not capture all at-risk buildings in our city. The greater appreciation of risk post Grenville has not been reflected in increased resources. As the Mayor has previously highlighted, following central government's recognition of issues in the built environment raised by this fire, the LFB received £5.5 million to carry out fire protection activities. This funding has been reduced for 2021 to 22 to £3.9 million, with no guarantee that it will continue in future years. The Mayor has called on central government to make this a permanent increase to reflect the current knowledge of risk. The significant reductions in funding for the LFB between 2009 and 2016 cannot be discounted as a contributing factor to the reduction in training or equipment across the organisation. Under the fifth London Safety Plan, published in 2013, 10 fire stations were closed and 27 appliances removed. Whether this in fact made a difference on the night of the Grenville Tower might be difficult to determine, but it demonstrates a depletion of resource for the London Fire Brigade with an absence of reinvestment elsewhere in the system. Since 2016, the Mayor has consistently funded the LFB at higher levels than those sent by central government in the funding that they provide to him for this purpose. In 2021-22, the Mayor provided £16.8 million to the LFB above the government expectation. It is beyond doubt that the wider financial challenges imposed in part by the impact, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic make this increasingly difficult to sustain. This inquiry has allowed for a detailed examination of the culture and effectiveness of the LFB, and it has been found lacking. As a result of the Phase 1 report, considerable change has already taken place within the LFB supported by the Mayor. The Mayor has already demonstrated his sustained focus on ensuring that the recommendations from your report remain a central feature of the transformation of the Brigade. He is similarly committed to ensuring that the LFB learns from the findings and recommendations which disseminate from Phase 2. The BSRs deserve to know that the London Fire Brigade and those responsible for ensuring and monitoring its effectiveness have addressed and will continue to address the issues which have been found wanting so that the Fire Brigade can deliver the service that Londoners deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, the next statement is going to be made by uh, Mr. Martin Seward on behalf of the Fire Brigades Union. So, Mr. Seward, if you're ready, do come up, please, and make your statement.
Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Members of the panel and assessors. I'll just get my toy working. A word in response to this morning's submissions, if I may, um, on behalf, made on behalf of the BSRs. The FBU fully supports the calls for a public sector duty of candour with teeth and a national oversight body to ensure that recommendations by proper authorities are monitored and followed up. The FBU appreciates the support of BSR Team 2 and recognises the criticisms of BSR Team 1, which deserve full consideration. The FBU wishes to assure the BSRs and this inquiry that the FBU will consider them carefully. These submissions are supported by evidence cited in our written submissions, mm -hmm. uh, which to save time we don't repeat here. Uh, we are willing to provide any references which the inquiry may request. Starting with a summary, although the lessons can and must be learned from the disaster, including by the LFB and the wider fire and rescue service, the building failure was so total and the systemic failing so widespread across the country that it would be wrong to scapegoat the fire and rescue service for the failures of central government and a corporate culture that made people's homes unsafe. The disaster was not caused by the LFB, but by individual private companies which were allowed to put profit before people. Grenfell was the culmination of a generation of central government policies, including deregulation and the war on the culture of health and safety, privatisation, fragmentation, austerity and the degradation of social housing. Weaknesses in the preparation and performance of the LFB can be traced back to the decision of central government to remove any form of national body for discussing and developing national standards, strategy equipment and operational guidance across the Fire and Rescue Service. The LFB's work was impeded by austerity cuts and privatisation for decades before Grenfell. The government cannot fragment and cut away at public services and yet expect them to shoulder ever greater responsibilities. Any deficiencies in the performance of the LFB were institutional or due to inadequate senior management. They were not the failings of the individual firefighters or control staff who attended the disaster. They did their best in accordance with their training and experience to save lives in face of an unprecedented catastrophe. The FBU strongly supports improved training for firefighters and more extensive inspections, and these require proper resources. It's easy now to, to say Staple should have been revoked and the tower evacuated by the first two instant commanders. However, this was without previous precedent in June 2017. Even now, after four and a half years, there's no national guidance on the full revocation of state put and evacuation of a high rise in the event of a major fire. We contend it's unfair to criticize the first two in instant commanders for not revoking state put in the first hour of the disaster. The individual firefighters who attended the disaster, including the first two instant commanders and the supervisors of the control room staff, should be relieved, we submit, of any individual blame. Grenfell Tower was not their fault. Moving on to the context in which the Fire and Rescue Service is being criticised. Grenfell was a perfect storm. After the manufacturing companies manipulated the flawed testing and stification regime, the private companies involved in the refurbishment of Grenfell Tower created a wholly unsafe building surrounded by highly flammable material from which the TMO's under-resourced and ineffective fire risk management system failed to safeguard the residents and then, when it became an inferno, the emergency response was unable to rescue 72 of them. The lack of care shown by the private companies involved in the disastrous refurbishment of Grenfell Tower and by the TMO as the primary responsible person was facilitated and enabled by policies made since 1979 by central government in the service of a social and economic system driven by the pursuit of profit above all else, including people. This agenda has been the dominant political ideology of most politicians in central government for decades. We submit the relationship between government policymaking and the interests and demands of business in this sector has been politically corrupt. Deregulation and the war on the culture of health and safety facilitated the use of inflammable cladding that destroyed Grenfell Tower. It explains the government's refusal to provide further guidance on approved document B and led to the fire safety regulations not being taken seriously within an all-embracing culture of complacency. Deregulation of fire safety legislation for the by the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order of 2005, 
deterred principal officers, for example, from pushing the need to clarify fire safety legislation, as they feared it would lead to even more deregulation based on the government's one in, two out policy. Deregulation of the fire and rescue service led to the abolition of national standards of emergency response, resulting in, amongst other things, a diminished predetermined attendance and the failure to research and develop a guidance for better communications and for the revocation of statehood and evacuation of a high rise involved in fire. Privatisation weakened public services and introduced conflicts of interest between safety and profit, as we've seen in the testing and certification regimes. In the LFB, privatisation led to lengthy delays in the provision of needed training, including incident command training following Lackanel, and prevented recruitment in the control room despite staff being below the minimum required. This in turn reduced the provision of FSG training. Fragmentation, another policy of the Fire and Rescue Service, led to the abolition of the Central Fire Brigade's Advisory Council and the Fire Service Inspectorate. Absence of such national bodies was a factor in the repeated failure to learn lessons from international fires or to address and resolve known problems affecting all brigades. Degrading social housing, chronic underinvestment over decades has enabled the cheapest is best culture to develop with any standard of materials, planning, supervision and workmanship becoming acceptable. And austerity cuts took a significant toll on the LFB, which was already under-resourced when they were introduced in 2010. In the decade preceding Grenfell, the numbers of whole-time firefighters were reduced by 22%, control staff by 13 and total staff by 23%. The cuts of, of the 9th of January 2014 saw the forced closure of 10 fire stations, including both Westminster and Knightsbridge, and the loss of 14 fire appliances, plus the loss of over 500 firefighter jobs. Then Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, removed a further 13 appliances in 2016. Cuts had also led to the removal of an aerial from the high-rise predetermined attendance, PDA, in two, 2005, a reduction in the number of fire safety officers, less training and the failure to recruit more control room staff. Andy Rose said that there's a level of investment in armed policing public order in the military that is absent in the fire and rescue service because fire is thought of as solved. Cuts and austerity do not excuse the significant failings of principal managements to prepare their operational staff to deal with a disaster such as Grenfell, but they hampered the ability of the LFB, both in their preparations in the run-up to Grenfell and in their ability to respond on the night. They provide some explanation as to why these failures occurred. We agree with the remarks of Professor Torero to the Warren Centre Fire Engineering Project launch in Australia on the 24th of July 2018 while these hearings were still underway in phase one. He said, so the expectation that the fire service should have understood building performance, the expectation that the fire service should have been able to manage the fire is a really unfair expectation. Document controller, please screen the transcript on day 191, page 171, at line 24 and following. Asked about, um, thank you, asked about um, that statement by Council to the Inquiry on the 21st of October 2021, Professor Torero clarified, so the point I wanted to make was that it was an unfair thing to blame those who are on the ground for all the mistakes they're making, when those who actually should have the competency to enable them to do a proper job have not managed to deliver that level of competency that makes them capable of performing the task. I follow said Council. So should we read the word fire service when you say the expectation that the fire service should have been able to manage the fire is a really unfair explanation as limited to those members of the fire service on the instant ground? And Professor Torero replied, yes, of course. As we submitted right at the outset of phase one, sir, the firefighters and control staff <coughs> have also been deeply affected by the Grenfell Tower disaster and it's unfair in our submission to blame them. The FBU, we set out the role of the FBU in our opening oral submissions for Module 5, and we don't, don't repeat that here, but wish to respond that some, to some of the criticisms of the FBU made in these modules. GTI has not yet called or heard from representatives of rank and file firefighters in respect of these criticisms, which we submit cannot fairly be accepted without this further evidence. The FBU firmly rejects the suggestion by our former uh, Commissioner Mr Dobson and Commissioner Andy Rowe that industrial action by its members was in any way responsible for any of the failures of the LFB, including in relation to learning the lessons from Lackanel House or in the provision of training. They were clutching at straws, 
trying to deflect blame for the significant and long-term failures of the principal officers leading the brigade. There is no evidence the FBU's lawful industrial action was a factor in the failures of the LFB's principal officers to properly train their operational crews, including disseminating lessons from major fires such as Lackanon. Where there have been difficult industrial relations in London at times, they've been the consequence, uh, we say, of principal officers such as Mr Dobson seeking to worsen the terms and conditions of the LFB workforce and to reduce their number. For example, firefighters were shocked and angered by his threat in 2010 to fire and rehire the entire workforce on reduced terms and conditions. The FBU negotiated a settlement after two days of industrial action. Again, in response to the LFB seeking to implement the government's proposal to reform firefighters' pensions by raising the normal retirement age from 55 to 60, so that they would, know, that they would work longer, pay more contributions and get less benefits, the FBU ran a hands-off our pen pensions campaign. The government's proposals were later held to discriminate unlawfully against firefighters. As part of this legitimate campaign, FBU members took strike action nationally um, on 50 occasions between 2013 and 2015, totalling 11 days of strike action over 37 different days for a varying, varying from one hour to four, four days long each time. So that's a total of 11 days strike action over 14 months from 2013 to 2015. Mr Dobson said these strikes were a factor in not rolling out training, including training based on a presentation on fires in high-rise buildings entitled Tall Building Facades. They can't have been. The Tall Building Facades presentation was first developed in July 2006, long before the strikes in 2013 to 15. A further presentation for the LFB fire safety staff was prepared in 2015, I, after the industrial action was over, there is no link between this industrial action and the LFB's failure to inform and train operational crews on the dangers of cladding systems on high-rise residential buildings. Further, the failures of training on PN633, Lackanel House and the fire safety staff presentation were also post-June 2015. Again, as the industrial action had ended, that cannot have been a factor in the failure of LFB's principal officers properly to train their staff on these matters. The FPU makes no apology for seeking to defend its members and the Fire and Rescue Service. That is what it exists to do. The FPU rejects the notion that it represents a conservative force that's unwilling to change. It has frequently led the debate on issues such as improved fire safety, the need for greater professionalism, equality and diversity, and the need to plan and train for new and emerging risks such as those arising from climate change. The FBU recognises, sorry, the FBU rejects any suggestion that the disaster was contributed to by some form of heroic macho need to get into the fire and to prioritise firefighting over everything else. There is no reliable evidence to support this being an issue amongst firefighters in the LFB. It's not as if they have ignored policies or procedures or failed to apply their training or failed to take more technical training seriously. They responded to Grenfell in accordance with their training and experience, but were not provided with the policies or the training to cope with the unprecedented situation they confronted. The FBU has continually pressed for improved training and professional standards, including for more effective 72D visits to enable firefighters to better serve the public and to protect the lives of firefighters. It has warned as far back as 1999 in evidence given to the investigation of Westminster about the dangers posed by cladding fires following the fire at Garnet Court. It has warned that lessons were not being learned from Lackanon House and other major fires. In 2013, the FBU provided a written statement and Matt Rack gave oral evidence on the 9th of September 2013 to the House of Commons CLG Committee investigation into the review carried out by Ken Knight explaining the impact of cuts on national resilience and the need for a CFBAC-type body. He said, and I quote, Our view is that there is evidence that fire services are not learning lessons from earlier tragedies and that we have coroners identifying that precisely the same point that has been made in a previous coroner's inquest is now being made in a subsequent one. I think alarm bells should be raised in the Fire and Rescue Service about that matter. We need a proper thoroughgoing debate around that, and an inspectorate is a very valid part of that process that, that we would want to see. It has also welcomed the re-establishment of the LFB Equalities Unit, and as you know, sir, it's committed to this full and open inquiry. Its members gave their evidence openly and without the assistance of lawyers, and on their behalf, 
The FBU is invested in the importance of learning the lessons from each and every fire to try and help save lives. If I can move on to the failure to translate knowledge of cladding risks into policy. The government and the principal officers in the LFB were aware since 2010 that combustible cladding and breaches of compartmentation had created a risk of rapid fire spread in and over high-rise residential buildings, that some of them were being refurbished without complying with the building regulations and were not being maintained according to the fire safety order. This awareness was neither conveyed to operational crews nor addressed in policies, guidance or training. The inquiry has already noted the lack of national guidance in respect of revoking state put and evacuation. And Mr McGurk accepts that there was no procedural guidance nationally or internationally on how an emergency evacuation of a high-rise could or should be achieved, that no training or policy for evacuating a high-rise residential building had been adopted by any fire and rescue service before Grenfell. At local level, the RICE approach was not investigated by any fire and rescue service outside the Chief Fire Officers Association South East Region. Mr McGurk told the inquiry that rice was only just on his radar in 2015 and that despite several fatal high-rise fires, the risks to occupants were not appreciated and alternatives to high-rise high firefighting were not on the agenda. We submit that this was pr primarily the fault of central government, which in the drive towards localisation abolished the CFBAC and the fire inspectorate, leaving no central body managing knowledge and sharing hazard and risk information in the UK Fire and Rescue Service. Thereafter, government failed to invest in fire research, and whether from the CFOA, NFCC, the Chief Fire and Rescue Advisor, CFRA, or the Fire Minister himself, failed or herself, failed to provide high-rise guidance. Options such as RICE should have formed the basis for discussion, research, and policy development at a national level. It is unrealistic, even where the subject matter is drawn to their attention, to expect fragmented, under-resourced fire and rescue services across the country to be on top of what might be happening at another fire and rescue service without adequate resources or national coordination. The inquiry has heard evidence that the LFB did not have the resources to learn from other risk-critical industries and that there had been an erosion of professional standards in London and nationally since 2003 with the dismantling of national structures. The dearth of national guidance under Section 21 of the Fire and Rescue Services Act, or otherwise, was not just an, on evacuation. There was no national guidance on other big issues of importance to all fire and rescue services that needed to be researched and developed, including on poor communications, the increasing prevalence of rain screen cladding systems on existing often old high-rise residential buildings, on the high risk of compartmentation breaches, on the requirements for responsible persons to prepare evacuation plans, especially PEEPs, and on the various recommendations made by coroners and other proper authority following earlier tragedies, including the recommendations to retrofit sprinklers. We submit it's unfortunate, Mr McGurk, who, who serves as expert to this inquiry, having been a leading figure in the <coughs> CFOA for 15 years before Grenfell, was not questioned further on why he and other senior fire and rescue leaders failed to provide any form of operational guidance on training or training on when and how to revoke stay put and evacuate a high rise, which might have made a significant difference at Grenfell, to deal with the issue of more effective radio communications at instance through the CFOA's technical committee, or to share learning from international fires and fires in different brigades, even though this was part of its role. Mr McGurk accepted that a national body or at least a national campaign to launch Porris would have been helpful. We submit that a properly resourced national body, crucially including the involvement of firefighter representatives, is not just helpful but essential to ensure that knowledge of risk is translated into policies and guidance which are properly discussed and then disseminated and implemented across the Fire and Rescue Service. Delegating this process to over 40 separate local Fire and Rescue Services to invent the wheel independently of each other was frankly, as the FBU said loudly in 2004, a recipe for disaster. Moving on, sir, to familiarisation visits, 72Ds. The Chair has already found that there were inadequate and that given their lack of training, no personal criticism can be made of Watch Manager Dowden or any other firefighters who visited Grenfell before the fire to carry out 72Ds. The evidence in these modules fully supports that conclusion. Crews were neither expected by management nor trained to do more than they did. As to purpose, 
Assistant Commissioner Brown, the principal officer responsible for 70 leave visits, said their purpose was familiarisation and that crews were not expected to assess the likelihood and impact of fire spread beyond the compartment. Mr McGurk agreed the purpose was to collect simple, accurate information to aid the officer in charge to make rapid decisions on arrival at an incident. Dr Grimwood told the inquiry that before Grenfell he would not expect crews to be picking up on differences of construction materials, panels, etc. as part of the 72D process. We submit further that with no aerial on the PDA, crews could not be expected to familiarise themselves with sighting an aerial at any high-rise building, supplying it with water or seeing how high the water could be thrown up the facade. The evidence in these models shows also that the LFB did not have the training or the resources to properly carry out 72D visits. As to training, Mr Brown said the training provided for these visits did not cover the testing of radio communications, nor the identification or treatment of external panels, facades or modern methods of construction, nor the possible external fire spread over the walls of a building. Frontline crews did not have the technical knowledge to look in depth at breach of compartmentation and fire safety regulations, and watch managers were not separately trained to carry, to carry out risk assessments on 72Ds, nor how to train their crews to do so. As to resources, no discrete time was allocated for doing 72Ds, thinking about them or writing them up. All of this was done while crews were on the run and liable to be called away. Uh, D DC George and AC Cowup and AC Brown all had reservations about whether it would be possible to visit all high-rise. The LFB didn't even have a basic database listing them all. AC Brown told the inquiry that initially they aimed to visit all high-rise buildings annually, but once the enormity of the task became apparent, they had to take a more risk-based approach. Mr Daly and Mr Dobson said there were not enough fire safety officers to look at 20,000 building consultations a year, nor to carry out joint inspections with crews. This echoes the evidence from Phase 1. For example, Mr Ricketts was asked, would you chase up a further 72D visit to test all these outstanding matters? And he answered, to be honest, sir, no, because of the volume of 72D visits we do, it's hard to schedule in further 72D visits. Moving on to Porris, sir. Neither the Porris guidance nor nor its introduction to the fire and rescue services was properly thought through, and the FBU contends was a further victim of central government agenda of deregulation and cuts. The implementation of Porris was not just defective in London. Mr McGurk told the inquiry that, if anything, it landed better in London than many other fire and rescue services. Porris was almost bound to fail, due primarily to central government and the way it was introduced. As to the guidance itself, Mr McGurk pointed out that Porris potentially conflicted with the established purpose of 72D, visit, 72D visits and effectively tried to combine two functions, a thorough risk analysis on the one hand and simple accurate information to help the incident commander on the other, which could have caused confusion. Additionally, the FBU had concerns that the proposed risk matrix in Porris valued a firefighter's life too low, and this issue required resolution at a national level. But instead, it was left to negotiations at local level. Wasteful. As to its introduction, it was wholly unrealistic to expect the existing and established practice of familiarisation visits to change simply by issuing the non-mandatory Porris guidance in 2012, in austerity, without even a series of seminars or conferences to explain it was a radical shift. And moreover, to introduce it without providing or warning of the significant training implications, the need for additional resources, including the significant involvement of fire safety officers, and additional time to carry out the visits. As Mr George told the panel, sadly, due to resources and budgetary constraints, there weren't enough fire safety officers. Mr McGurk said also that after 2005, links were already weakened between the fire safety departments and operational <coughs> crews who rarely undertook fire safety inspections as they were focusing on community fire safety work. The FBU supported and supports enhanced inspections to help protect both the public and firefighters. Guidance such as Porris should be developed at a national level in conjunction with stakeholders across the fire and rescue service, including the trade unions, and should be in the form of mandatory national policy and not left to the discretion of individual fire and rescue services, which can only lead to further fragmentation and different approaches being adopted under, across the country. And of course, it must be properly resourced and preceded by proper training. Here, there was none. The LFB's equipment and its adequacy for the purposes of high-rise firefighting. 
Here the FBU focuses on communications and aerials. Communications were a further victim of deregulation, fragmentation and the cuts. There was no national guidance for local fire and rescue services, which, as Professor Johnson reported, separately faced the known problems in the field of communications, including propagation issues affecting the use of UHF radios in high-rise concrete buildings, which had been highlighted and made the subject of recommendations in previous inquests and investigations. Professor Johnson reported that the systems available at Grenfell did not meet an acceptable level of reliability, were again ineffective and again put residents and firefighters at increased risks. These problems emerged as unintended consequences of the choice of equipment and systems relied on for fire ground communications, with limited coverage and signal, localisation, congestion and interference. Here we see another massive training gap. Mr Groves told the inquiry that the hoped-for training solution to the communications problems identified at Lackanall were not delivered by Babcock to Cruise before Grenfell. The Babcock training package contained only a very basic description of LFB's communications equipment and did not instruct Cruise about the difficulties encountered when firefighting in high-rise buildings. There was no specific radio communications training for firefighters beyond their initial training. None of the reading materials available to, to firefighters trained them how to optimise communications to overcome a total comms failure, why those difficulties occur, or how to overcome them in high-rise buildings. A word about repeaters and leaky feeders. Only um, EDBA extended duration breathing apparatus wearers were given practical training on how to deploy radio repeaters and leaky feeders. The support package for senior officers did not instruct that high-rise materials such as concrete and metal can disrupt signals nor distinguish between radio repeaters and telemetry repeaters. Untrained and unpracticed and through no fault of their own, firefighters at Grenfell mistakenly deployed telemetry repeaters instead of radio repeaters. Airwave radios. These could well have assisted crews that attended Grenfell. Mr McGurk agrees with Professor Johnson that they have advantages being digital, with better coverage and reliability, and with the capacity for talk groups. As Mr O'Keefe told the chairman in phase one, an airwave radio would have been useful at the bridgehead on the night. The failure to provide airwave radios or other reliable means of communication for crews working inside the tower was another casualty of austerity and the regime of cuts. Although denied by Gary Reason, resistance to the wider use of airwave radios was driven by cost as identified in internal LFB emails referred to in Professor Johnson's report. The FBU admits that proper communications on the fire ground are essential and the development of communication systems should not be left to cash-strapped fire authorities, even one as big as London. Again, this should be the responsibility of a national body. A word about aerials. Provision of an aerial appliance was dropped from the predetermined attendance for high-rise incidents from 2005 due to cuts. The FBU does not suggest having an aerial would have been a cure-all or guarantee stopping a cladding fire or the safety of residents, but we submit that Mr McGurk should address the question whether an aerial on the PDA would have made a difference to the outcome at Grenfell. Not being on the PDA, Paddington's turntable, turntable ladder A213 did not arrive until 1.32. It took a further 10 to 15 minutes after its arrival for it to become operational, by about, by about 1.45. It then applied water to the east face of the tower until some time before 2.25. Dr Lane's report shows a photograph of it applying water to the east facade at 2.05, reaching about floor 10 before it had to be moved due to falling debris. Soho's um, aerial arrived, A245, arrived later and was set up in seven minutes. It then applied water to the east face of the tower for most of the early hours. The downward external fire spread was halted between floors, 10 and, between floors 7 and 10 on the north, west and, and south sides by the use of handheld jets and ground monitors. It was halted much higher at floor 18 on the east side due to the use of an aerial, which thus markedly reduced external downward fire spread. Dr Grimwood told the inquiry that an exterior stream from an aerial appliance could be used to control the spread of an external fire. If an aerial had been on the PDA from 2005, we submit it's reasonable for the panel to draw the following inferences as to pre-planning. Aerials would have been considered on 72Ds for high-rise residential buildings. Crews would have been trained on and familiar with the use of an aerial at Grenfell 
siting it on the east side and supplying it with water at that location. They're likely also to have worked around the problem of siting it on the west side of the tower by arranging for the removal of the bollards and to have engaged with specialist bulk media advisors to overcome the water supply problems. They may also have considered the problems of applying water to the north and south sides, either by siting an aerial there or otherwise, and would have had, in any event, a greater awareness of the limitations of an aerial at Grenfell. And on the night, an aerial appliance mobilised by the PDA could have been on the scene at 1.13 and within minutes it could have been applying water to the east side of the tower where the fire was spreading upwards and breaking in, not reaching the top until 1.26. Mr McGurk declined to speculate on whether a better outcome could have been achieved with better resources. This is an important stone left unturned in this inquiry. We submit Mr McGurk should be asked to give an opinion on this issue, particularly in light of Dr Stoyanov's evidence. But if not, then it's open to the panel to conclude that an aerial on the PDA would have made a difference, both to pre-fire preparation and to the emergency response on the night. Moving on to training and, and outsourcing to Babcock, we've dealt with communications and won't repeat that. And uh, I refer without citing um, paragraph 27.26 of your phase one report, sir, in which you um, exonerate um, Watch Manager Dowden and those who accompanied him on 72D visits, saying that, um, that, that they can't be blamed for the, for the inadequacy of those visits. And you went on to say it's equally plain, however, that they, they had been given no training in the evacuation of high rise buildings generally, or in how to recognise the need to evacuate such a building, or how to carry out such an operation safely. These failings were inst institutional in nature. And no personal criticism can be made of Watch Manager Dowden or any other firefighter who visited the tower before the fire. The principal officer's evidence in these modules has substantiated those findings. So former commissioners Dobson and Cotton and assistant commissioners Brown and Daly accepted significant failings, including that operational crews were not trained in the revised PN633 after 2015, nor in the lessons from Lacanal nor when and how the staple strategy should be reversed. And the practical real fire training proceeded on the basis that fire would rarely extend beyond the compartment of origin. After the fire in the Maddingley block in Kingston in 2010, Mr Firkins of the LFB's fire engineering group reported, we may want to advise as an interim measure that early evacuation of the building should be considered rather than defend in place. An increase in the PDA may be justified to support this, end of quote. But this information was not passed to the crews, nor did fire engineers in the fire safety department assist in developing PN633 for high-rise, nor did the principal officers address the issue that Mr Firkins had, had uh, raised. Maddingley was just one of many such examples of missed opportunities to learn as an organisation, due in part to complacency from senior leaders who did not appreciate that a fire of this scale could occur and seriously underestimated the risk associated with high-rise residential buildings. The culture of complacency was evident in Mr Dobson's presentation to insurers less than a year before Grenfell entitled, High-Rise, Not High-Risk. Given these admitted failures to train and inform operational crews, it's very difficult to see how a junior officer can be fairly criticised for not revoking stay put and evacuating the tower. Outsourcing. A key re reason for the LFB's training failures was the outsourcing of training to a private contractor, Babcock, in April 12. It was pushed through very quickly ahead of elections in May 2012, anticipating a change in the political control from Conservative to Labour. The LFB was thus tied to a contract for 25 years for which Babcock lacked the expertise and was not ready to fulfil. The FBU strongly opposed the decision to privatise training and the LFB's experience with Babcock from 2012 to 2017 shows they were right. This was most starkly evident in the lack of training for instant commanders. Moving on then to instant commander training, Babcock's lack of subject matter expertise led to significant delays and ultimately its failure to revise a revised instant commander course or any interim training package on the lessons of Lacknell House prior to the disaster. The inquiry has learned that principal officers misinformed elected members that 
and I quote, Babcock has confirmed that all seven issues, those are lacking issues, all seven issues are covered in the existing suite of command training. This was inaccurate. The existing training needed enhancement. Although aware of Babcock's lack of expertise and its failure to address the lacking issues, Mr. Reason spared Babcock the scrutiny of elected members. Babcock likewise tried to cover up its lack of expertise. Alastair Cumming of Babcock sent an email to Mr. Groves about instant command training saying, I'm satisfied that the requirements of the coroner have been met and can be reported as such. This was not the case. Steve Green of the Learning and Development Strategy Team wrote in an email on the 14th of December 13 that Alastair Cumming of Babcock knew fully well the requirements of the coroner had not been met and was trying to pull a fast one. But, but Mr. Green's concerns were not followed up by principal officers. Having initially recommended the development of 16 command decision exercise scenarios, CDEs, to start with, this was quickly reduced to a proposal for six and then was further reduced to one, the Holcroft House CDE. This was completed by August 2016, three years after the coroner's recommendations in March 2013, to which it was a wholly inadequate response. It was restricted to, to level one instant commanders. It only envisaged two FSG calls, half the number at Lackanor, and it gave no guidance on why the instant commander should consider a full or partial evacuation if the building had had remedial work and failed to train firefighters on the extent of the risk posed by external fire spread and poor compartmentation. It gave no guidance on how to go about conducting a partial or full evacuation of the block. There were also structural problems with outsourcing with the dismantlement of the LFB's own internal training department, which could no longer provide internal training, and the loss of the five-day training course for station-based trainers from April 2012. There was a, a serious conflict of interest here. We submit that the inquiry should approach the evidence of Mr Dobson on outsourcing and future training provision for the LFB with significant caution. He did not make it clear that since his retirement as commissioner, he's worked as a consultant for Babcock, a very clear conflict of interest. He was not questioned about this obvious conflict of interest, despite it being raised with the inquiry. We submit parts of Mr. Dobson's evidence to the panel was unreliable, particularly to the effect that, one, the responsibility for providing subject matter experts for Babcock was with the LFB. This, as the chair noted in, in evidence, this is a surprising statement, given given that Babcock had sought and won the contract to provide training, and in so doing must have professed that they had the necessary expertise. And two, he disagreed with the former Commissioner Cotton that prior to the outsourcing of training to Babcock, any required training could be provided. He volunteered this at the end of his evidence and did not explain his contrary view. So our conclusion on Babcock, this is a further example of central government policy, privatisation, impacting on the LFB in a way that may well have contributed to the disaster. The LFB senior leaders were at fault bringing in Babcock and then, having done so, failing to ensure they were providing the necessary training. Without the introduction of Babcock, there would have been sufficient expertise in the training department and significant delay would have been avoided. Training issues identified by the Lacanor coroner could have been dealt with far earlier, certainly by June 2017. The panel will need to consider whether the judgment of LFB's principal officers was affected by their being too close to a profit-making private company. Evacuation and stay put. The chair has found that stay put should have been reversed at some point between 1.30 and 1.50, and evacuation ought to have been attempted. Mr McGurk has agreed, while stressing the serious risks and difficulties of such an attempt and noting that prior to the Grimford Tower fire, there was no practical guidance to fire and rescue services on how it could be done, neither national nor international, as I said earlier. Operational crews in London had not been informed that building failure wasn't rare, compartmentation could not be relied upon, and that some cladding materials were combustible, nor of the heightened risk of total building these combined risks presented in cladded high-rise residential buildings involved in fire, nor of the resulting need to consider revoking stay put and evacuating such a, a building, and hadn't been trained when or how to do so. However, Mr McGurk has neither volunteered nor been asked, despite the FBU's suggested lines of questioning submitted to the inquiry, as to how a full evacuation could have been achieved that night. Consequently, we are left with his opinion that it should have been attempted, 
notwithstanding that the stay put strategy had never before been fully revoked, nor had a high rise residential building involved in fire ever been fully evacuated. These were institutional failures of central government, CFOA, and the LFB, which render unfair the criticism of the initial instant commanders for failing to revoke statehood and move to evacuate the building. A word about generic risk assessment 3.2. Neither that nor any other policy gave any guidance on how to evacuate um, a high rise involved in fire, nor on the circumstances that would trigger an evacuation. Peter Cowart told the inquiry, that for the entire UK Fire and Rescue Service, consideration of evacuation was something of a blind spot. There was no national guidance to cover it. Nor did GRA 3.2 warn of cladding and other construction features which promote abnormal or rapid fire spread. Charged with the task of revising GRA 3.2, Mr Cowart misunderstood the risk from cladding as being only the creation of voids that would conceal fire spread, not that the cladding itself would burn. Given that the BRE and the government were aware of the risks of flammable cladding as early as 1991 and that Mr Cowart was drafting guidance on behalf of a government department, we echo his question, why did they not bring this to his attention? Professor Bisbee reports that the, the risk of rapid fire spread associated with combustible cladding systems was deliberately downplayed by government and this significantly contributed to the widespread misunderstanding of this risk. He reported the Nosley Heights overcladding scheme represented not one flagship policy but many and has unearthed a handwritten note evidencing a request from a government press office to play down the issue of the fire in 1991. It required a national body with government support to grasp the evacuation nettle for high-rise residential buildings and either to resolve it by issuing national guidance such as now recommended by the chairman or to close high-rise residential buildings with combustible cladding. The government and the CFOA failed to grasp this nettle. What about Rice and the Kent standard operating procedure? Rice and the Kent SOP did not deal with or provide guidance to firefighters in relation to a full evacuation of a high-rise residential building in the event of a major fire spreading beyond the compartment of origin. At most, it raised the possibility of evacuation as one of the possible strategies to consider right from the start of a high-rise incident. In June 2017, Rice was not then a policy in Kent but a command decision-making tool, an aid memoir to alleviate command stress and prompt a predetermined rapid analytical thought process, where local or total building evacuation may be given earlier consideration prior to a firefighting intervention. Even now, there remains no policy or method, even in Kent, for evacuation of a high-rise residential building involved in fire. And at the time of Grimfell, rice had not been adopted by all the other fire and rescue services in the southeast region. Rice was, and is not, some sort of magic formula. There is no certainty the Rice approach would have made a difference. Mr McGurk said it might have, but no more than that. He recognised that any attempt to apply Rice would have, been, would, have been, would have faced the particularly challenging circumstances of Grenfell, and uh, Mr Brown, on behalf of FOA, has already outlined. Uh, I won't repeat those. The FBU has concerns about Kent's policies. The stairwell protection strategy could expose firefighters to significant and avoidable danger by placing them above the bridgehead without breathing apparatus, or with BA sets that have not been started up. Dr Grimmond was not asked about this issue and instead described TBF 15 uh, without any challenge by counsel to the inquiry as to the impact this procedure might have on firefighter safety. These proper concerns remain. Policies requiring firefighters to go above the bridgehead without activated breathing apparatus were proposed in the LFB and in Greater Manchester, but both have, have since been withdrawn. In the LFB, this, this followed the finding of an independent health and safety advisory panel. In Manchester, the policy was, was withdrawn following an application for judicial review by the FBU. A third fire and rescue service, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, is persisting with such a policy, and the FBU have again applied for judicial review in that case. There have been too many firefighter fatalities in high-rise residential buildings to ignore firefighters' health and safety in designing policy. Mr McGurk noted the Kent SOP was wanting on mobility-challenged evacuation and emphasised in the strongest terms the need to avoid jumping to the simplistic conclusion that had the Kent SOP been in place, it would have prevented fatalities at Grenfell. The FBU accepts that Rice was and is worthy of consideration, research and development at a national level in consultation with the Fire and Rescue Services, with 
responsible persons with the FBU and others, although the union would not support lowering existing breathing apparatus safety standards. The FBU notes the DCLG and CFOA did not investigate Rice before Grenfell. We welcome the development work that is now happening as a result of the Chairman's recommendations 33.22 A and B. We contend it should have received such consideration much earlier, but didn't due to the fragmentation of the Fire and Rescue Service and the abolition of HMIFS and CFPAC. And here we are, four and a half years afterwards, and still no national guidance on evacuation, despite that recommendation. Policy note 633. The LFB's principal officers now accept there was no guidance in PN120 or anywhere else as to when and how a statebook should be withdrawn or the alternative strategies should be implemented. Mr. Reason sought to qualify this, however, by saying that evacuating a high-rise was not unusual, particularly partial evacuation. The FBU strongly disputes this and contends that in living memory in the UK, no high-rise residential building involved in fire had ever been fully evacuated before 14th of June 2017. There had been partial evacuation of the flats, proximate to or directly above the fire flat as at Shepherd's Court, an action that was in fact undertaken at Grenfell alongside self-evacuation and rescues. Instant Commander Biles at the Adair Tower fire said he did not revoke stay put. And asked about this, Mr Dobson did not understand what he had actually done. We say this is not an example of revoking stay put, fully or partially. The FBU contends that stay put was not revoked, either of these, or at any fires before Grenfell. Uh, the R RBKC and TMO between them had not provided any evacuation plan for Grenfell residents beyond the state put strategy, so there was no responsible persons plan for the instant commanders to build upon that night. Mr Daly had never come across an instance where the responsible person for a high-rise residential building had in place a contingency evacuation strategy, which included changing to a full evacuation of the building in the event that the state put policy had to be abandoned. And on that recommendation that you've made, sir, um, not much is, is yet happening uh, beyond the temporary waking watches in high-rise residential buildings with, with dangerous cladding. Uh, a culture change is still needed amongst responsible persons to initiate the process of planning and practicing evacuation drills. The government is in favor of implementing recommendations 33.22 C, E and F for responsible persons evacu evacuation plans and peeps, but must now back its implementation by responsible persons and residents and its enforcement under the fire safety order with national guidance and resources. This all begs the question, how can Mr Dowden and Mr Walton be realistically criticised for not doing this in the first hour of the emergency response? Moving on to the decision-making models and research. Watch Manager Dowden and Station Manager Walton were, were trained in and applied the normative decision-making model. Dr Cohen Hatton's research showed that 80% of instinct commanders' decisions are reactive to what they're seeing, either instinctively or by learned behaviour, and that the, the DMM was not sufficient to help instinct commanders avoid falling into decision traps. She found that a watch manager is more likely to be using intuitive processes than a more senior commander with more time. The decision control process, DCP, was developed to introduce a stop and think stage between making a provisional decision and implementing it. Likewise, in 2010, much earlier, Dr. Grimwood had found in his first two seminars, using a facade fire scenario involving rapid external fire spread, that the Kent Instant Commanders were all thinking only of fighting the fire and not exploring other options. By contrast, after being trained to consider other tactical options using the Rice mnemonic, Dr Greenwood and his colleagues in Kent saw outstanding improvements. These were theoretical exercises and there's no evidence of how the training was applied in practice. Notwithstanding the recommendation of the National Operational Guidance, NOG, or Instant Command, on Instant Command, and the Future of Instant Command, both documents published in 2015, Watch Manager Dowden and Station Manager Walton were not trained by the LFB and did not apply either the new decision control process for instant commanders or the Rice mnemonic. 
Based on their lack of such training on the night of, the, uh, of Grenfell, Dowden and Walton were likely to react and we contend should not be criticised for reacting in accordance with the way they were trained, namely by persisting in trying to effect rescues and fight the fire instead of considering other options such as revoking Stayport and fully evacuating the tower. We submit the instant commanders were doing their job to the best of their ability in accordance with existing policy, their training and experience. They did so in unprecedented and appalling circumstances. The Grenfell Tower fire was unprecedented because never before in the UK had a fire in a high-rise residential building spread out of control to engulf even one complete facade, let alone the whole building. They wanted and tried to save lives. The failings identified in Phase 1 were entirely due to a combination of institutional failings in the Fire and Rescue Service, both nationally and within the London Fire Brigade, which undermined the LFB's emergency response and deprived these individuals of the tools they needed to revoke statehood and evacuate the tower. They were not individually responsible for any of these institutional failings. Additionally, and taking a broader view, the FBU further contends it's unfair and disproportionate to continue to hold the firefighters and instant commanders responsible for any part of the tragic loss of life and suffering occasioned by the fire in face of the evidence disclosed in phase two, which we've referred to already. Document controller, I wonder if you'd be kind enough to put that up again, um, the same passage from Torero. Uh, and once again, we cite Professor Torero's important clarification, which you can see on screen, it, expressing his view that it would be really unfair to expect those on the instant ground to manage the fire. So moving on, sir, to um, our request to the panel and to you and the panel to, to relieve instant commanders of criticisms in the phase one report. Accordingly, the FBU respectfully asks you to revisit those criticisms. This is essentially for not having uh, taken the decision to revoke Stayport and evacuate the tower between 1.30 and 1.50. In addition to their innocence of the systemic failings outlined above, the FBU asks the panel to take into account the following. Firstly, if, as the chairman has found, the early instant commanders could not conceive the possibility of mass compartmentation failure and the consequent need to consider and then order a total evacuation of the building. This was due to their, relevant, uh, their lack of relevant training and experience. And the possibility was foreseeable by the LFB, as has now been conceded by Commissioner Rowe, and yet the instant commanders and the crews under their command were not informed of it nor trained what to do if they should encounter it. Without being alerted to the risks of this possibility, the instant commanders could not reasonably be expected to consider, improvise and then order a total evacuation of the building. They should not be criticised for their failure to do so in face of, of Grenfell. Secondly, it wasn't reasonably obvious that responses to FSG calls were ineffective until significantly later than 1.50. Watch Manager Dowden did not know of any FSG calls until after 1.35 when the first admin call to CU8, Command Unit 8, started. The first list of three FSG calls was taken by Watch Manager Kentfield to Dowden when he was talking to, to Station Manager Loft just before 1.40. The first operational response to an individual FSG call was not attempted until 1.51 when firefighters Cornelius and Murphy were briefed at the bridgehead to rescue a man now known to be Dennis Murphy from flat 111 on floor 14. They tried repeatedly to contact the bridgehead on their handheld radios to say that they would not be able to bring the people down, but they received no answer and heard no radio traffic. They did not debrief the bridgehead until around 2.19, their end of wear time. Thirdly, Watch Manager Dowden could not have been expected to obtain information about the success and uh, of search and rescue deployments in response to FSG calls before he handed over command at about 1.50. In line with PN 790, and as discussed with Station Manager Loft, he reasonably tasked Loft with coordinating the emergency response to FSG calls soon after 1.40. At his handover to Walton shortly after 1.50, Dowden didn't have any information about the operations inside the tower, and there was too much traffic on the radio to communicate with the bridgehead. This is likely to be true, both because Mr. Dowden was a patently honest witness and because there were difficulties communicating from outside the tower to the bridgehead and vice versa. 
Although others were aware of the poor conditions higher up the tower, Dowden was not. Having tried but failed to radio the bridgehead, uh, crew manager Stern and firefighter Hipple later informed O'Keefe at the bridgehead about 1.38 of the poor conditions they had witnessed on floor 16 and of the failed rescue attempt on floor 16 with one person still unaccounted for. But watch manager O'Keefe had lost radio comms with Dowden after make, make pumps 10 at 1.24 and was not communicating with him and sorry, and what was communicating with him via uh, Watson and other officers as runners. Dowden does not recall receiving this critical information, which he probably never received due to communications problems. Watch manager Dowden cannot reasonably be expected to have known the stairs would only remain passable for a limited period by 1.50, nor station manager Walton by 2 o'clock. This could only have been worked out by receiving reports of poor conditions in the st stairway, which he did not receive, or by observing the reduction in numbers of self-evacuees from 1.50 to 2, 2 o'clock. He didn't log the rate of self-evacuation, for which he was not trained and had no experience, and so he did not have this information. Moving on, uh, sir, to, to the control room, FSG policies, training and understaffing. Uh, you, sir, found that the control room was overwhelmed by unprecedented number of 999 calls, which together with the magnitude and speed of the spread of fire presented each member of the control room team on duty that night with a challenge wholly outside their experience and training. You found there were serious shortcomings in the operation of the control room, which could not be attributed, not all be attributed to the scale of the incident, and which were in the main systemic. Systemic failings in the control room. FSG policies. Uh, you found that there were deficiencies in the FSG policies, PN 539 and PN 790, and the reference information files created thereunder. And we've set these out in our written opening statement for Module 6A and, and only briefly summarise them here. They couldn't cope with more, these are the policies, couldn't cope with more than about six FSG calls at a time, gave no guidance on what control staff should do when the number of FSG calls occupied all the available control room operators, and so the capacity of both the FSG policies and the control staff were already outstripped by 1.30, and notwithstanding paragraph 293 of the LFB Lacanal report, they did not warn of the danger of assuming without information from the instant ground that firefighters were on the way and rescue was at hand, or of the consequent risk of lulling callers <coughs> into a false sense of security. Failure to deliver training in control uh, is another of the systemic institutional failures that led to the disaster. Control staff um, had limited experience of taking FSG calls, and so training was particularly important for them. Yet, as Mr George accepted, there was a chronic and systemic failure to plan, deliver, and record training in control. Joanne Smith encountered difficulties when pulling, pulling control staff from the watch for training. The issues surrounding vision crowded out consideration of other issues that were affecting control. The training audit recommended by Station Manager Kelly in 2010 never materialised, partly due to vision training sidelining everything else. Notwithstanding Joanne Smith's scathing review in September 11, in 2012 only 68% of staff undertook FSG training and in the following years less than 30% undertook any kind of FSG training. Accordingly, the expected post lacanal FSG training, including annual refresher training, did not materialise. The role play element of FSG training with fire safety officers promised after lacanal was never implemented. And Assistant Operations Manager Norman, who fulfilled the role of Operations Manager on the night, had not been trained how to supervise the control room. <coughs> the recommended two-week supervisory package with a Minerva-type exercise was never created or delivered. Nor was she ever trained on when, in what circumstances and how to change the stapled advice or what to do if the number of FS FSG calls occupied all the control room operators or otherwise how to cope with a major incident generating multiple FSG calls. The limited training of some CROs facilitated for some command units did not train any of them to engage in two-way communications between the instant ground and control. This is confirmed by the command unit workshops injects, which required no information from the instant ground, and so it was not two-way communications. 
As Joanne Smith told the inquiry in phase one on the 11th of July 2018, as usual, we are the ones that pass information to the crews and to the instant commander and to the instant command pump. It's not really a two-way channel. Understaffed, particularly with supervisors, it's now clear the control room was understaffed having lost 21 posts over the period from 2011 to the night of the fire. These posts were lost due to a failed attempt at privatisation of the control room, the CAMS project, which led to the temporary loss of five control staff from 2011, made permanent from 2012. The introduction of vision software, which led to the loss of three control staff to the operational support team from 2014, to the night of the fire, which required a lot of staff time to develop fixes and train staff how to use them, and the assumption of new functions, the resource management centre, that led to the loss of seven staff, and the Fire and Rescue National Coordination Centre, that led to the loss of six staff, uh, without recruiting any additional staff. On the night, control had minimum numbers on duty, eight control operators and three supervisors. And when Joe Smith arrived at, at about 2.15, she was, and I quote what she said in her statement, her first statement to the police, she said, she was acutely aware that we needed more staff and in particular supervisors to help. There were tears, lots and lots of tears. Looking around, I can only describe the staff as broken. AOM, Assistant Operations Manager Norman, fulfilled the role of Operations Manager. And whereas there should also have been three uh, uh, AOMs on duty with her, there were only two, Debbie Reel and Peter May. This put them all under increased pressure, especially in the early stages of the fire, when they started to receive FSG calls. And so we submit that with deficient policies, limited experience, an absence of relevant training, and a shortage of staff, including supervising officers, the control staff were not provided with the tools to enable them to handle the multiple FSG calls generated by Grenfell, to liaise with the instant commander to discuss the worsening situation, or to reverse the statehood advice. Of the specific criticisms, uh, made in your phase one report, sir. Um, AOM Norman and to a lesser extent her fellow supervisors are criticised in particular for failing to seek information from the instant ground about the progress of operations, the development of the fire and the actions being taken to resolve FSG calls, despite setting up a direct phone link with, with uh, CU8 and speaking to watch manager Merrick at 135 and 147. That's uh, paragraph 29. <coughs> 170A. For failing to stand back from taking 999 calls from 130 to 140 when the flow of FSG calls became a flood and deciding how to manage the collation and transmission of FSG information to the instant grounds in a way that ensured that clear lines of communication were established between the control room and the command unit. And for failing to realise that in some cases control room operators were not obtaining all the necessary information or should have reminded them of the need to do so, even on the briefest of calls. In relation to these specific criticisms, we ask the chairman and the panel to take into consideration the following additional factors. The information from the fire ground was dynamic, with callers changing locations, making it difficult to identify their whereabouts in the early stages. AOM Norman rightly, we submit, prioritised communicating the first FSG calls to CU8 on the fire ground and did not complete that task until around 1.50, when the control room was still inundated with 999 calls. Two control room officers had been unable to radio the first service request to the instant command pump, G271, despite multiple attempts from 1.31 to 135. Unbeknown to control, there was no one manning the main scheme radio on the instant command pump, with all the firefighters on the fire ground being busy on other duties, and the messages were not received. In between taking 999 calls, AOM Norman rightly, we submit, prioritised communicating these FSG calls to the first command unit on the fire ground in the admin line call that, that started at 135 with watch manager Merrick. She gave him such details as she had, including flat numbers and floors. She explained the control room was inundated and they were overwhelmingly busy. She then took another 999 call at 1.39. She received Watch Manager Merrick's message sent at 1.43 that CU8 was set up and ready for further messages, whereupon she made her second admin call to Watch Manager Merrick starting at 1.47, again giving him all the information she had about each FSG call. 
We submit it was not reasonably practical during either of these calls for AOM Norman to ask Watch Manager Merrick for any information from the instant ground about the progress of operations. The development of the fire and the actions being taken to resolve FSG calls, he'd only just arrived, CU8 was still setting up, and he could not be expected to have any useful information. Moreover, they were both consumed with information about the FSG calls, which they both realised was of the highest importance. The decision to revoke stay put was uh, taken in the control room at, a, at, at about 2.35, some 20 minutes after Joe Smith had arrived in the control room and had assessed the worsening situation. Not taken immediately, it was taken 20 minutes afterwards. It was taken by, station, by, by uh, Joe Smith in discussion with Deputy Assistant Commissioner Fenton. Mr Seymour, I, I have to ask you how you're getting on. You've had more than, quite a bit more than your hour. Have I? I? Well, I noticed that I'm just approaching the conclusion. It was luckily Would just creeping up on the screen at that moment. Very convenient. Then. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, sir. So, as I was saying, that um, that, that decision was taken by Joe Smith um, in consultation with a Deputy Assistant Commissioner um, who... Uh, had also had the benefit of seeing one side of the tower fully engulfed in fire on a TV in the Brigade Coordination Centre at about 2.33. Those were senior officers, whereas AOM Norman was a junior officer struggling on in an understaffed, under-resourced office without the situational awareness to be derived from a visual image of the fire. We therefore ask you to revisit those, those criticisms and say that the control room staff, including their supervisors, were swamped and did their best in harrowing circumstances. So to the conclusion, sir. We finish where we began, reminding the GTI of the importance of assessing the performance of the Fire and Rescue Service in the wider political and economic context, apportioning blame where it's due, particularly in relation to those who created and enabled this truly horrifying disaster. We accept there are important lessons to be learned by the LFB and the Fire and Rescue Service, more generally from Grenfell. Central Government, the CFOA, NFCC, CFRA and the LFB failed to equip and prepare operational crews, instant commanders and control staff for a major disaster such as Grenfell. It's essential there's a national body to oversee policy and guidance in the Fire and Rescue Service, including involvement from the trade unions. The frontline professional firefighters' voice must be heard. Any changes or improvements to the Fire and Rescue Service that may be recommended by the panel, and we understand core participants are not being asked at this stage to suggest any such, but they will be given an opportunity in due course, need to be properly resourced. Central government cannot deregulate, privatise and cut away whilst at the same time increasing the duties of the Fire and Rescue Service, e.g. regarding community fire safety, but nevertheless expect the Fire and Rescue Service to perform as if nothing had changed. It's bound to lead to deficiencies and mistakes. It mustn't be forgotten, the LFB did not create the disaster through either the construction of a building or its subsequent refurbishment. It failed in every way to protect the safety of its residents. That was the legacy of a generation of central government policies allowing a profiteering free-for-all in the construction industry without any proper regard for safety. Whilst it's right that the LFB is held to account for its performance on the 14th of June 2017, it's wrong to scapegoat a public service for a disaster created and made possible by others. It's particularly wrong to blame the individual firefighters and control staff who attended the disaster in its early stages. They did their best in line with their duty and their training and in our submission should not carry any part of the blame for the failings of the emergency response. Thank you for your patience and those few extra minutes. Thank you very much, Mr Seward. Well, at that point, I think we will take the afternoon break. Uh, <clears throat> we'll resume at uh, a quarter to four when we'll hear a closing statement from Mr Walsh, Queen's Council, on behalf of the LFB. Good. Thank you. Quarter to four, please.
Now, the last closing statement in this series is going to be made by uh, Mr Walsh, Queen's Council, representing the London Fire Brigade. So, when you're ready, Mr Walsh. Thank you uh, very much, uh, sir, and good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ms Estefan and Mr Atball. Um, you will not be surprised, you might even be slightly relieved to hear me say that I have no intention of attempting to address you uh, on the entire contents of the London Fire Commissioner's 64-page closing statement, which is obviously now a matter of public record for anyone to read should they wish to do so. Uh, in any event, uh, much of its contents will be familiar to you from previous submissions on behalf of the Brigade, and that is because certain issues are of such importance that they require restating, or at least revisiting, now that we've heard all the evidence adduced in Modules 5 and 6. Uh, but can I just make something clear, because of some potential confusion which may have uh, arisen from submissions that were made this morning in relation to the statement of the Fire Officers Association, the FOA. Um, can I make it very, very clear that the London Fire Commissioner has repeatedly said that the brigade accepts the inquiries, your, your phase one recommendations, and as I think you know, uh, is actively addressing them mm. as we speak and has done for some time. So the LFB does not, the LFB does not ask you to revisit any of that. Um, now, statements from the Fire Officers Association, or indeed the Fire Brigade Union, the FBU, uh, as uh, both of them national employee representation bodies, are entirely separate from the London Fire Commissioner and the Brigade. So submissions that are made in those documents should not be attributed. I mean, there may be that sometimes there's agreement, of course, but, but submissions in those statements should not be attributed to the LFC. Uh, neither of those bodies speak for the LFB or the London Fire Commissioner, and they are entirely separate organisations and entities. So th there was a, a, a potential for confusion about, um, to an extent, conflating what the FOA is saying with, with what the LFC is saying. We want to make it very clear that they are very separate. The LFB statement, which you have, sets out the position of the London Fire Commissioner on a wide range of issues, uh, among which are, there are many others, but among which are, first of all, the accepted need for reform at the LFB locally and also nationally, the approach to planning fire and rescue operations based upon the complex and very often knotty issue of foreseeability which is not a binary issue, as I've made the representations to you before, the practical limitations and challenges faced by fire and rescue services when responding to fires in substantially failing buildings, which were designed to sustain a stay-put strategy, and an account of the extensive work which the Brigade has undertaken on policy, procedure, the use of equipment, which has been informed by the Brigade's own investigation following the fire and the resolute work of this inquiry, which has informed the Brigade a great deal in its lesson learning. So for present purposes, we would just like to touch upon a very few matters which really should be addressed to you orally today, and I'm likely to take uh, not much more than half an hour, I hope. First and foremost, uh, we must emphasise as it must always be so, that the London Fire Commissioner and those commissioners and senior staff who went before him feel deeply that the Brigade owes it to the bereaved survivors and residents of Grenfell Tower and the vicinity and to the wider community to learn lessons from the tragic events of the 14th of June 2017. Learn lessons. We've said this in some submissions to you so many times over the last four years that one tries to find uh, different ways to express that sentiment. 
and the genuine acceptance of responsibility which the LFC re has repeatedly made for shortcomings which you, sir, expressed in your phase one report and which certain of the inquiry's experts have identified in their phase two reports. Of course, the use or overuse of the phrase lesson learning in its various forms can be interpreted in all sorts of ways. So what does it mean for the brigade? Perhaps it's best to use the commissioner's own words. During his evidence at the end of module six, he described the cumulative failures which have been revealed during this inquiry on, on the part of multiple organizations as, quote, the most appalling example of institutional failure, I think, in recent British history. And we, the LFB, were part of that as well. In, in expressing himself so candidly, he implicitly, as well as explicitly on numerous other occasions, acknowledged that the brigade needs to improve and work tirelessly to identify and implement improvements wherever possible. And I will return to um, an account of what has been happening in recent years. But of course, that raises the question, what part of the broader failures, which he referred to on the part of so many organizations, was played by the LFB? That is to say, what could and should the LFB have done better? Now, certainly, as others have said, uh, it was not responsible, the brigade, for the failings which were exposed in modules one to three of phase two on the part of so many who were connected with the refurbishment of the building, which one must always remember precipitated the eradication of essential fire safety measures upon which residents and fire services rely, and which in turn caused the devastating fire and contributed to the way it developed. Uh, I think um, it was described in submissions this morning, well, that's just an obvious thing to say, but I'd say it anyway. But the LFC does, frankly, accept a number of shortcomings across a range of the brigade's undertakings from pre-planning, information gathering, to training. And indeed, it's fair to say that a number of the witnesses in modules five to six, those, those former senior officers of the London Fire Brigade, identified and accepted that there were shortcomings of themselves in relation to particular matters. Um, some of those accepted shortcomings are set out in the written statement to which I have referred. For example, the findings of Assistant Commissioner Jonathan Smith, starting at paragraph 98 of the statement, regarding practice and training in the control room. But it could, they could also be identified from the extensive remedial work which has taken place since the fire and more recently. The severe consequences of the Grenfell tragedy were also recognized by the commissioner during his evidence. They are a constant reminder to him and to the brigade as a whole of the pressing need to bring about meaningful change. He pointed, you may remember, to the devastating impact on the bereaved survivors and residents and to firefighters who were selfless in their efforts to respond to the fire despite the dangers which they faced, and a fact which you, sir, of course, recognized in your phase one report for which the commissioner is extremely grateful. He said this, though. I'm going to read a quotation out to him. It actually doesn't, it doesn't appear, actually, in the written statement. So I'll just, I'll just say that it's at day 213, 1st of December, page 100, line 19, to page 102, line two. He said this, all I know is that my personal experience of the Grenfell Tower fire and the unimaginable impact it had on so many families and individuals and what it's done to my firefighters as well, they've had years now of being told that they did not do the job that they should have done. And in fact, it is a great mistake, I think, not to recognize that the need for improvement in the institution 
does not relate to the courage and endeavour of those firefighters. And it's been very difficult for them to hear this. Uh, he went on during his evidence to touch upon his military experience by drawing a comparison with the armed forces covenant with its own personnel, but in relation to the, uh, the, to the brigade, extending its application to the community at large. I quote again, he says this, so I absolutely owe it, firstly to the bereaved and survivors who in their dignity and their desire for answers have, I think, been an inspiration. And I owe it to Londoners because that is our job and it is our covenant and it is built into the DNA of the organization. We owe it to ourselves to challenge ourselves continuously. And then finally, in relation to this quotation, speaking of the range of work which the brigade has done in the last four years or so, he said, I think the reason we've done it now is, I'm afraid, because the Grenfell Tower fire was the most terrible shock to the London Fire Brigade, because I saw firefighters and officers put in a position that they should not have been put in. I saw the damage it did to the community and I think it's not just me. I would not take the credit for the, any of this. I think it's through every level of the organization. There is an enormous desire to do right by the people who suffered the most and to do right by Londoners and by ourselves. You know, the military again talk about a covenant with soldiers. I think decent frontline firefighters and officers deserve us to honor that covenant by bringing forward these improvements. Now, those are extremely candid statements on behalf of the Commission of the London Fire Brigade. And the brigade is very firm in its assertion that that same level of candor was demonstrated by other present and former London Fire Brigade staff when they came to give their accounts to you in both phases one and two. And I wasn't necessarily going to, but I am going to spend a little more time on the issue of candor in light of some submissions that you heard this morning. Yeah. None of them, none of those witnesses, we say, sought any form of undertaking from the Attorney General that their evidence to you would not be used against them elsewhere. They were frank and open. Many of those who gave evidence in modules five and six are now retired, and in some cases they've been retired for quite a long time, but they all expressed a genuine desire to assist the inquiry as best they could. Their collective approach reflects the open and transparent culture of the LFB as a public body. The LFB is very aware of the need for transparency, openness, and candor as a public body. And that openness was demonstrated, we say, through both, both phases of the inquiry in which the brigade facilitated the attendance of over 80 personnel to give evidence in phase one and 15 during modules five and six of phase two of this phase. Actually, um, we made the point in the LFC's opening to phase one all the way back in 2018 that all of the LFB witnesses were expressly urged by the brigade, not that they needed to be, but they were, to be open and straightforward in giving evidence without any form of agenda, save that it was imperative to learn le the lessons that should be learned. From watch manager Dowden, who was the first witness in the spring of 2000, uh, 2018, giving evidence over three and a half days, to the London Fire Commissioner himself in December of last year, all, we say, cooperate, cooperated fully and sought to answer the, the inquiry's questions to the best of their ability. Given their respective positions in a very large organization uh, 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 and in the context of the passage of time. And I, 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 look, I, I know I've said what I'm about to say before, <laughs> But I'm going to say it again now because it bears repeating in light of the submission this morning. On the question of candor, openness, and transparency, apart from the disclosure 
of over 117,000 documents. The brigade also devoted, as you know, substantial resources to the process of providing assistance to the inquiry, particularly in phase one, in many forms. That exercise, for those who need to be reminded of it, uh, included the com complex task, because it was complex, of analysing the huge body of evidence that, that had been gathered by the LFB in an effort to piece together the clearest possible picture of the events of the night. A series of operational response reports were compiled for each of the first seven hours of the fire, which <coughs> provided a minutely detailed factual narrative, second by second where possible, of the actions of firefighters drawing together key information from witness statements which were cross-referenced with breathing uh, apparatus, telemetry, CCTV and other media. And a similar exercise was conducted in the preparation of a single control report which detailed the actions of officers in the control room. And as we have said in the written statement, it is, we believe, fair to assert that it was substantially that body of evidence which informed the contents of the firefighting sections of the phase one report. And your findings, sir, of course, on a number of issues. That was all the product of the brigade's open and candid approach to this inquiry. Well, I turn now to an important question which has been the subject of some debate in the public arena. Can fire and rescue services provide a solution, complete or otherwise, from an operational firefighting perspective to the failings of those concerned with the design, construction and maintenance of high-rise residential buildings. We appreciate that this is only one aspect of a much wider range of considerations which the LFP needs to address and which are dealt with in the written statement. But it is of vital significance because this question impacts upon so many other factors which concern operational procedure, communications, pre-planning, risk information gathering, and so on. And it's also of national importance. In the written statement, we have repeated the basic principles of uh, building design and safety requirements for high-rise residential premises with a stay-put strategy, which, of course, emphasizes the importance, indeed the necessity, that the regulatory and legal requirements must be complied with, if not to the letter, at least broadly. We have also set out the challenges faced by fire and rescue services where these measures are substantially flouted, ignored or wholly undermined for whatever reason when responding to fires in such premises. And we have addressed you at some length on a number of occasions previously on several of those aspects in previous submissions. So today, I'm going to try and approach it differently in a short, relatively short summary. Assuming for these purposes that a building in question has fallen well below the level of safety which the building regulations provide for, and the stay put strategy, described of course by Dr. Lane and others, quote, as the single safety condition provided for in the design of high rise residential buildings in England, is wholly undermined, the options available to fire and rescue services to mitigate such extensive failure in fire safety provisions on the fire ground is extremely limited. It would mean as we know only too well, that the stay put strategy would need to be abandoned. But as Professor Torero says in his phase one report, and I quote, the means by which the fire service can alter the strategy are very basic. By knocking on flat entrance doors, by op operating sounders within residence flats, uh, and so on. And all of these approaches, he says, are inconsistent with fire that is spread vertically or horizontally. Uh, and that, of course, was the case at Grenfell Tower. Now, th th those are problems that have to be overcome. This is not an excuse for not doing anything, but they are the reality that has to be overcome. But when one combines that significant problem with the substantial challenges involving the physiological capacity of firefighters, 
and the duty of fire and rescue services to protect the safety of their employees, which are set out in more detail in the written statement, fire and rescue services are placed with serious obstacles which they must try to overcome insofar as it is possible to do so. But the challenging of o challenge of overcoming those obstacles is further hindered by the design of high-rise residential buildings, which is di dictated, of course, by the building regulations according to certain assumptions. And those assumptions include, first, only single-unit fires are anticipated or allowed for. Well, I, I take this from, from the inquiry's experts, of course. It's not just me saying it. Multiple fires on multiple levels are not anticipated or allowed for. Vertical or lateral fires on the exterior are not anticipated or allowed for. And simultaneous evacuation on a large scale is not anticipated or allowed for. Indeed, buildings of that kind are designed so as to inhibit mass, I mean, not to completely restrict it, but certainly to inhibit mass simultaneous evacuation through the provision of only one single, one stairwell without additional fire suppression systems or sprinklers and so on, and the absence of building-wide fire, fire alarms and the inability to alert residents and, again, so on. So that's, that, that's the position. And in other words, the building regulations, <clears throat> and this is the challenge for fire and rescue services, and the wider regulatory, regulatory regime which governs the design, construction, and maintenance of high-rise residential buildings, make no provision at all for the circumstances in which the single fire safety condition upon which the assumptions of the regulations are based is wholly undermined. It isn't contemplated in, within the building regulations because broad compliance is assumed. Once local authority building control departments, the bodies responsible for ensuring compliance with the regulations, certify compliance through the issue of a certificate. Now, it may be, as we've said before, that the significance of those challenges provides some, some explanation for the absence of any guidance in National Generic Risk Assessment, GRA 3.2, about how to formulate contingency plans for the evacuation of buildings of this kind. The continued absence of any such national guidance, as many others have commented upon, despite the ongoing work of the Home Office, which has to be recognised, as Stephen McGurk, the inquiry's firefighting expert, has observed, underscores the real problems which exist in this regard. But it's important that I make it clear that the, the London Fire Commissioner does not offer the continued absence of national guidance as an excuse for the LFB's failure to develop such contingency plans prior to June 2017, because that's a matter for them. But it is an important consideration when looked at in a national context. Uh, and we say that the issue may well be the subject of interesting further exploration with certain witnesses in Module 6B, which you are about to begin. We just put a marker down as far as that is concerned. Uh, so taking the position prior to and at the time of the Grenfell Tower fire, Mr. McGurk, when he was addressing the effectiveness of the LFB's fire firefighting on the night of the fire, offers this view uh, in his phase two report within that context, external firefighting. He says this at paragraph 180. I would state that any evaluation of the effectiveness of external firefighting is extremely difficult. <clears throat> this is because of the multiple obstacles associated with design and access difficulties, as well as numerous construction and building design failures, but most especially the impact of the cladding. These aspects are described in detail by Dr. Lane's, uh, uh, by Dr. Lane, says Mr. McGurk, in, his sec in section 90 of her report, so I don't propose to repeat her commentary here. However, I do emphasize the fact that the internal firefighting provisions of Grenfell Tower failed simultaneously with the failure of virtually all other passive and active fire safety features. And that meant that the standard operational firefighting method normally employed 
for high-rise buildings by the LFB could not be implemented. This presented, says Mr. McGurk, a truly formidable challenge to the LFB, especially to the first crews. Expressed simply, he says, Grenfell quickly moved from being a compartment fire to, a multiple, to multiple compartment fires, to multiple compartment fires concomitant with the building itself being on fire. The circumstances meant that any operational response was always going to entail extensive improvisation. And he concludes this part of the, the, the quote by saying, I think it, it is unreasonable, therefore, to suggest that the LFB ought to have anticipated an external fire of this nature, and it is against the, this backdrop that my subsequent comments should be considered. Well, so, uh, uh, of course, the London Fire Brigade and other fire and rescue services around the country now at least must try to find ways to restrict or limit the need for improvisation when fighting fires of this kind. It's, it's, it's something that the London Fire Brigade, the commissioner of the, of the, uh, and the brigade itself has been wrestling with and working very hard in consultation with the National Fire Chiefs Council and the Fire Brigade's union and others. And notwithstanding those challenges, the commissioner's commitment to learning the lessons that can and must be learned from the Grenfell Tower fire is evident, we say, from the comprehensive improvement work that has been ongoing since June of 2017. Improvement on this scale is challenging in an organisation of the size and nature of the LFB with its demanding multifaceted operational undertaking. But much has uh, been achieved through revisions of policy procedure and training, although there is more which the LFC seeks to accomplish through significant changes in organisational processes, which I've addressed you on before, systems, culture, culture particularly, and engagement, which will strengthen the brigade's response to high-rise residential fires in the future. And the need to ensure the organisation is capable of, of effective change into the future is reflected in the creation of the new role of Director of Transformation in June of 2020, who is accountable for ensuring that sustainable change, it's all about sustaining change, across the organisation is fully delivered. And an extensive account of that work can be found in the London Fire Brigade Improvement Progress Report of October 2021, prepared by uh, Assistant Commissioner Andy Bell uh, with a summary and, a, and an update provided at paragraphs 132 to 187 of the written statement. The work is, of course, ongoing, as the uh, Commissioner explained in his evidence in December of last year, but it remains his chief priority to ensure that the changes which have been set in train already are sustained into the future and reviewed regularly to keep pace with developments in the built environment. Uh, and so before I conclude, I think it's probably fair, I, I should do this, just to provide a few examples of that work, <clears throat> which is the result of wide consultation with the National Fire Chiefs Council and others, as I have said. This, this is just a few examples, but they're important ones. The brigade has developed new and revised policies which address high-rise firefighting, first, evacuation, second, separately, and fire survival guidance, thirdly. Each of those policies, which are closely interlinked, uh, provide guidance and procedures for incident commanders and control staff to follow, including communication strategies, in extreme circumstances of the kind experienced at Grenfell Tower. In relation to high-rise and evacuation, the brigade delivered face-to-face -face theory training to approximately 4,500 staff within a year during the pande pandemic, and that involved attending a day-long exercise session, which was partly appliance-based, 
and was designed to replicate through role play with the involvement of the control room the management and passage of large numbers of FSG calls. And this is being followed by large-scale exercises to which all of the officer cohort is uh, invited, which are designed to place incident and other commanders into situations barring actual flame, which are as real as possible by, for example, using smoke generation and simulated casualties and that sort of thing. And to date, the brigade has run five large-scale exercises uh, and a further 18 are scheduled to take place by the end of May of this year. Further policy developments address risk information gathering and incident command, while extensive work has been carried out to improve information sharing between the brigade's specialist fire safety and engineering department and operational staff. That, as we know from the work of this inquiry, is absolutely key, and the, the commissioner accepts that. It is important to, I shan't, I, I know what was meant when the word silo was used this morning, but one has to, one has to bring the different departments of such a large organization, such as the LFB, together so that there is communication between them. And that's what that part of the, the program of reform is seeking to achieve. The changes to operational risk information gathering, they're, they're intended to enable crews to be more familiar with the built environment in their, on their station ground. And recent training to all operational staff has meant that they, uh, it is hoped they are better able to recognize the signs of building failure and to put appropriate mitigations in place in the context of the new policies. In the field of incident uh, command training, the commissioner has established a dedicated incident command training team to ensure that there is a uh, consistency of training uh, uh, through command unit crews and the control room, uh, facilitating more effective lines of communication in that regard. And um, uh, as I'm sure you would expect, there has also been a very significant restructuring of training in the control room uh, as part of the brigade's control improvement plan. Um, and then just one or two other matters. Uh, <clears throat> a number of changes to incident communications, importantly, have also been implemented with the use of a wider range of radio channels mm -hmm. and the procurement of new fire ground uh, and breathing apparatus communication equipment, which is to come online this year. And there have been enhancements also in a range of other operational equipment, including the continued use of escape hoods, uh, fire hoods, which the LFB having was the first to introduce them in the country after the, uh, after the fire itself. Then there are new 32 meter and 64 meter turntable ladders. And just as another example, the development and the use of drones with thermal imaging capabilities. All of those matters have come in, into train uh, since uh, the fire and since the, work, uh, the, since the Grenfell Tower fire. But those are only small examples, actually, of the much wider piece of work. So, in conclusion, the question whether the London Fire Brigade is a learning organisation was uh, addressed to a large extent by past and present senior officers who gave evidence in modules five and six when they were given then an opportunity to explain the challenges and in some cases the realities of providing firefighting and rescue services in one of the most populous and complex and densely built cities in the world. But as the LFC made clear in his evidence towards the end of phase one, large communications must always develop policy and procedure through learning from experience. We now know it needs to be more than just experience, but th 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 that is the sentiments. And that culture must be embedded, he says, and never ending. He, Commissioner Rowe, is determined to ensure that the London Fire Brigade is proactive in its approach, particularly with regard to the increasing complexity of modern construction and design methods and materials, insofar as the impact on fire safety. And the wide-ranging and comprehensive improvement work which we 
as I've said, is only briefly summarized today, has been ongoing now for some time. However, the Commissioner made it clear during his evidence at the end of Module 6 that the question whether the LFB has learned from Grenfell Tower and that tragedy can only be answered in accordance with the outcomes the Brigade delivers to London. The Brigade is, we say, it's about that business, it's going about that business and trusts itself to do so thoroughly. But I'll leave the last word to the Commissioner. He said in his evidence to you, so I don't ask for trust. I don't think we deserve to ask for trust until we demonstrate different outcomes. I think, he said, we are beginning to do that. So those are my closing submissions on behalf of that. Well, thank you very much, Dean, Mr. Walsh. <coughs> well, uh, that completes the oral statements that we were expecting to hear today and indeed at this stage in the proceedings. <coughs> we had set aside a few more days for oral statements um, because we thought that there might be other core participants who would wish to address us. But as it turns out, that time... Uh, will not be required. So we shall not be sitting for the rest of this week. Um, the hearings will continue on Monday of next week, 31st of January, 10 o'clock as usual, when we shall resume hearing evidence in Module 6. So uh, at that point, we shall rise and we shall look forward to seeing those of you who wish to attend here on Monday of next week. Thank you very much.